Um, all right, do you want to do the countdown? Three, two, one. <laughs> okay, that's the countdown. Um, okay, I, I, you know what? It's been a long, I'm going to leave this one off. Sandra, normally you leave, but I'm going to leave. So everyone, go. you know, as, as you all know, it's been a while hey, since we, hey, we did our last. Hey, go, yeah. Gordon, I got, Gordon, I got a quick suggestion for you, brother. I'm using a video production company to shoot my episodes. Uh, and, Pedro, uh, we're, we're you, live on YouTube. Uh, we're recording. We're starting. So. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't think he was recording yet. Okay, welcome. <laughs> Thank you, buddy. And, and we love you. And I may even keep that just because I like you. Okay, but just, you know, do, do it after and put yourself on mute. Okay, where was I? Everyone, it's been obviously a while since we did Crypto Wednesdays. The last one was end of November. I had some health issues, which, you know, not COVID, but some other stuff. Uh, I was e eager to get back this whole time. It just couldn't happen. But I appreciate the loyalty of this group and just people kind of rolling with it. We all stayed in communication and thrilled to be back. Just very happy to be back. Right now, I'm still in Los Angeles. It is dark outside. It is 5.30 in the morning, our usual fun time to do the show. And unfortunately, I'm off coffee these days. I'm drinking tea. So, you know, there's a lot of willpower involved here. But welcome back to Crypto Wednesdays. Um, before, we get into the and the before we get into the topic and our wonderful panel, uh, I would like to introduce my co-host, Sander. Sander, please say hi. <laughs> hey. Hey Gordon, so good afternoon, good morning, good evening everybody. Welcome to see a lot of familiar faces back. Well, and there you go. Okay, uh, just I'm going to do a two, two second plug. Crypto and blockchain attorney. That's all I'm going to say. It's not the Gordon show. Sander, two second plug. Yeah, sorry. I, I was just live streaming on YouTube with a double signal. So welcome everybody. Good afternoon, good morning or good evening. We have people from all around the world. It's good to see familiar faces again. This is the second year that Crypto Wednesday show is brought to, broadcasting. This is our first show in the new year, 2021, which is, is, which is a very uh, and will be a very positive year, not only on the business side, but also on the health side and personal development and stuff. So we're really excited. We've got a few great shows coming up in the next couple of weeks. And this is one of the first of our Dubai series that we're going to do in the next couple of weeks. I know that Gordon and a few of our friends are flying into Dubai in just a couple of days. So I think for today, we got a really great panel. We're excited for all of our guests to be here. So thank you for spending some time with us. We will stream live on YouTube. And also afterwards, please share the recording with your community and invite as much people as you can to the Crypto Wednesday show. So maybe Gordon, I can head over to you a little bit sure. uh, so we can move forward and uh, introduce our panel. Absolutely. Okay. So like Sander mentioned, uh, I'm actually going to be in Dubai for in two weeks, sorry, in two days for two weeks. And I was there in December and I was blown away by the entrepreneurial spirit, the technology, the mix of traditional and modern, the embrace of blockchain and technology. It, it just was, a, it's a very exciting place. And I have to say, you know, COVID's affecting you everywhere. COVID's affecting, of course, United Emirates as well. By the way, this is the United Emirates, Arab Emirates show. We're going to touch on any Emirate that comes up. It's not Dubai specifically, but, you know, Dubai leaves to mind just because I was there recently. Um, and I, I've known Arena, one of our pants, for a very long time. I had the pleasure of meeting George recently. And my affectionate term for him, which he resents, is the mayor of Dubai. You think you think that's like putting a, a, a bullseye on his back. I, I think it's a compliment, but we'll, we'll kind of explore it. And so we have George. I, I, and by the way, I'm not good with names. So if, if I mispronounce anything, just correct me. Uh, George Sebastio, Sebastio, am I saying this correctly? And you got to unmute yourself, my friend. Yes, yes, I, it is correct. Uh, George Sebastian, it's a pleasure to be here. Very good. Uh, and and it, once I go through all the names, I'm, I, I just want to get this name correct. And then I'm going to go to each one of you and we're going to do the origin story. And then uh, Danish Kochani, Kotani, am I saying that correctly? Uh, no, uh, it's Danish uh, Kotani. You know what? I'm not even going to say names. I'm just going to like, point at you. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's say Danish. It, it okay. It, well, yeah. it's, it's my fault. I'm, I'm just learning. So just you know, bear with me. Um, Arena, did I say your name correctly? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, uh, you can pronounce my name however you like. Um, you're one of the few people who is exempt. It's Arena, like we Irina. play sports. Arena. Oh, Arena. There you go. And Said. And off mute, my friend. 
Al Dermaki, yes. Very, <laughs> I'll help you out there. Very, very good. I, I'm going to go by first names, just the kind of crib. I don't mean to be informal, but it's it's just what I need to do. Okay, let, let, let's kind of dive in. Um, the analogy or metaphor I always like to use, use is, you know, when you have Marvel movies, you know, the, the movies about the comic book heroes, everyone eventually gets their origin story movie. Like you have Wolverine, the origin story, or Superman, the origin story. And since we have a super pa superhero panel, I want everyone to introduce themselves and kind of give us their origin story. I find that this is very interesting because it kind of lays context for the interactions that are to follow. So I'm going to start off with Mr. Mayor. Mr. Mayor, I, I, you're going to live with that forever. You know, it's, and it's, it's, it's okay, no bro. I am George Sebastiao. I am basically a CTO, CEO, and advisor in quite a few projects. So I am an entrepreneur. So I assist a lot of startups in the implementation of their technologies. Apart from that, I'm also a super connector. Uh, we run something for the last two years uh, in Dubai, but also across other cities called ECOX, stands for Ecosystem Connections. Mm -hmm. And primarily we understand that uh, to actually have proper successful business, uh, there's three or four things that are extremely important or ingredients to success. Uh, um, and typically uh, any kind of business needs uh, people or resources. Uh, they need uh, an idea or a technology, but they also need uh, connections or business development uh, to be successful. So the combination of those three ingredients uh, is uh, extremely important. Actually, we sometimes, I got this from a colleague in Saudi for many years, we call it MBC, like the TV show. Mm -hmm. And each letter means something, money, brains, and contacts. So if you have money, brains, and contacts, then you have a good chance to actually achieve a successful business. And ideally, if you, if you don't have it personally, you can form a group that has it. But, you know, we, we, we can all contribute something. So give us a little bit more about you. What, what's your, where are you from? How did you get into this? How did you end up where you ended okay. up? What, what, what was your good, path? Good question. My path was, uh, I was born in Lisbon, Portugal, at the age of zero, I guess. And uh, I lived the first 10 years of my life in Portugal. So I did learn to speak Portuguese and Spanish in high school and all that. But, um, we had kind of an Arab spring in Portugal around 1970 something. Uh, hmm. And at that time I was luggage with my parents. So we moved to Montreal, Canada. So I spent the next... Uh, was that the Alcazar uh, government? Am I remembering Yes, that Salazar, Salazar, Salazar. Salazar, yes. Yeah, so that, that, that was the like Portuguese was... version of Franco. Yes? Correct. Yes. Okay, yeah. So, yes. so, so that means I ended up in Montreal. So I had to learn a new language, French, then English eventually. So I did my um, uh, high school, college, and university there. And I did my first 10 years of work in Ottawa, but not just in Ottawa. I visit pretty much every place across Canada and the uh, United States. So I was lucky enough, probably the only place I did not visit or the, was the Northwest Territories and uh, Yukon. So I guess a little bit maybe adverse to extremely co cold weather. Yeah. And then about uh, 25 years ago, me and a colleague, um, we are having a barbecue in Montreal and we decided where can we go and not pay any taxes? So we came up with a short list and the list was quite the World Bank, the United Nations, African Union, and the Middle East. So we say, okay, well, the first opportunity that comes, we go. So we ended up uh, joining the Middle East. And at the time, actually, first country I arrived was Bahrain. Wait, so let me pause you a second. That's fascinating. You didn't decide on the place. You decided on the criteria and then kind of reverse engineered the place. Correct. If I'm here, yeah. if I Yes, that's yes, the first time I've ever heard anyone actually say that. That's yes. that's cool. <laughs> so it, it could have been United Nations, could have been African Union, World Bank, or Middle East. Right. So it ended up being the Middle East. Uh, simple reason: I had worked for Computer Associates for five years, so I ended up, uh, um, you know, working the first five years in Computer Associates Middle East, where I became the Assistant General Manager, mm -hmm. and it was quite successful. We took a CA Middle East from about. Uh, 20 people, 15 people to almost uh, over 100 people 
and we covered all the countries in the Middle East, all the way as far as India and Pakistan. So it was kind of, you can call it the wide Middle East and a few countries sure. in Africa as well, all the way up to uh, Morocco as well, including Lebanon. Uh, so this was a very good way to get introduced to the Middle East and get to know everybody across so many uh, geographies. And since I guess we talk a bit about crypto, to re resume that, um, uh, some recent things I spent about five years as CTO at Huawei. And during this time, uh, one of my bosses says, oh, there's something called blockchain. You should go and study it because it's good for you. Mm -hmm. And we want to use it in our data centers. I said, okay, no problem, it's my pleasure. So about seven years ago, I got introduced to blockchain as a technology, not per se crypto. So I looked at from an enterprise and a cloud and a data center perspective. Mm -hmm. And that brought me into the world of blockchain, crypto, et cetera. And it was quite a good uh, idea because in the last sev uh, seven years, we have probably been involved in over 50 different projects, some successful, some disappeared. But overall, uh, I think the technology uh, of blockchain has matured substantially to the point that today uh, we have substantial innovation and applications of this, uh, both uh, in cryptocurrencies, but much beyond that in the context of enterprise blockchain uh, in terms of powering cities and governments to enable a whole new new generation of trust. And that's where I got to meet all the good people that you have here in the panel, including Saeed, Irina, and a few others hiding behind the, the screen and Danish as well. Uh -huh. So we kind of trade stories from time to time on a few of these investment opportunities. I think, Dennis, we were at the time talking about a system that was on a highly new generation uh, mobility last mile system based on hydrostatic uh, um, batteries known as quick that you can charge in seven minutes. But obviously, there was a payment system uh, involved in it that was based on blockchain and cryptocurrencies as well. So and this system is now live in places like Singapore or Vietnam amongst other places, so electrical bikes, as well as uh, scooters as well, very similar to the way Lime works. Mm. So we have been involved in a whole multitude of extremely interesting projects uh, and, uh, you know, lots of uh, coffee, lots of pizza to keep us going. So you're, you're, you're on the entrepreneurial health food diet, like the rest of us. Correct. Something like that, yes. So we, now and then we go to the, the holistic one, but we have to do both sides of the equation. So a after the show, you and Sonder should hook up because Sonder is on some massive health kick I don't even understand. We we won't necessarily, deep, we're not gonna dive at this show, but just like, he's a good man to know. So okay. he's, he's getting yeah. he's getting us all straight. But you know, you look good to me when I when I, when I I see you, so. Always my pleasure, thank you. That, and you, then you were kind enough, to, oh, I, I guess I'm just gonna move, you know, what looks like in order to me on Zoom. Um, you were kind enough to introduce us to, uh, and guys, I'm gonna mask your names all show, and I'm sorry, Danish, if I'm, and please tell us about yourselves. Oh, I got a thumbs up, that, that works. Give us you, your company, your origin story. Just tell us about you. Yeah, sure. Um, so um, I'm, I'm one of those kids that were born and raised in Dubai. My father came in the early 70s. He was here to decirculate the Indian rupee that was used before the dhirum, uh, before 72. So we've been here for the last uh, 50 odd years. And uh, having said that, uh, um, I've schooled here. I uh, have a degree in journalism, economics, and investment management out of London. Um, Burj Financial is my company. Uh, it was started in 2012. And uh, having said that, we are, uh, we are, we've got three layers of Burj Financial. One is the investment holding company which is our idea of uh, succession planning within the family. And uh, Burj Financial invests into everything that I thought was, uh, uh, was uh, interesting and attractive, right from uh, cigars to uh, facilities management, to technology, to jewelry, and, uh, and, it's more, and you know, shorter term financing in the market. So we used to do all of that. Uh, we mm. still do. We still hold... Uh, a substantial amount of assets in real estate globally and stuff like that. And then came the consultancy part of the business, which is geared towards uh, corporate finance and uh, uh, advisory for corporate finance. So we have a gentleman who's, uh, uh, who's worked for 19 years 
in uh, corporate finance who runs that department. And uh, the final part of the puzzle was uh, Burj Financial Technology Solutions, uh, which we started roughly three years ago. And uh, with the belief that uh, we had a great team that could, that could do due diligence on technology platforms that uh, investors were investing into. So we worked on behalf of a number of uh, investment banks uh, that uh, had investors uh, anywhere from one to $20 million who were investing into technology platforms. And we would do the due diligence of the platform and of the team running the platform. Hmm. So we would look at everything uh, uh, from the business model to the token model to, and, and give our opinion on um, what we thought were a clear representation of risk versus asset and including the patent models and everything else. That business did fairly well in times of boom uh, until COVID hit us. And uh, then we started two other businesses uh, simultaneously. Uh, we are uh, one of our investors. Let me pause you one second. It's a re respect for not sticking your head in the sand during COVID, but to actually starting two more businesses. I just want to highlight that. That's quite the, that's quite the proactive slash reactive slash agile move. So please go ahead, tell us about them. Yeah, so, so what usually happens uh, is that uh, when, you know, we had a choice, I had a choice, right? Either we could just sit back and uh, count how many losses we were taking and how, how we were bleeding in terms of private equity and commitments, mm -hmm. or we could start looking at uh, uh, different opportunities to try and uh, engage with further revenue models to ensure that uh, since the world is changing, we have to adapt with it. So we did two things. Uh, we were already invested and we looked at a technology uh, out of the UK, which was uh, online fund administration, because uh, internally one of the corporate uh, uh, finance activities were monitoring deployment of capital. So what we were doing was every time somebody invested, we were doing the monitoring and reporting to the limited partners or the investors of how their investment was doing. So we were mitigating private equity risk, mm. whether uh, you call it a startup growth model or whichever, or angel investing, one of the biggest uh, risks in the market was people not knowing what other people were doing with their money. And I had created a, a model for that, whereby we were actually looking after a, a number of investments for high net worth individuals just by monitoring and reporting. So I guess the natural integration would be uh, from a forward perspective is to get into online fund administration, which I thought was disruptive. Uh, against the Apex and the Maples and the SSNCs in, in jurisdictions that were pre-existing. For example, the UK, Cayman, BVI, Isle of Man, Delaware. We didn't go all the way into um, uh, places like Luxembourg simply because they were more based out of uh, uh, common law, uh, sorry, commonwealth, uh, they were civil law rather than common mm -hmm. law. Mm -hmm. We wanted to stick to jurisdictions that had common law, which were more global. And uh, we invested or we became partners with a platform that did online fund administration. Since we started that relationship, uh, we now manage roughly, we've, we've incorporated roughly seven funds and we look after three uh, of those funds in terms of being non-executive directorships and uh, monitoring deployment of capital. So let me, let me pause you, since the advent of COVID, you've established seven funds. That's Yes, since last year. That's great. Impressive. Go ahead. So basically, what what we've done is we've given um, uh, we've given companies the ability to cost efficiently structure GP and LP models. So instead of uh, you know taking liability risk, mm -hmm. uh, you are under limited liability, liability partnership, and uh, you can actually create a biannual NAV and look at a valuation model rather than uh, you know have this discussion on what's my value, how much do I need to sell. You know, do it the proper way. And uh, very recently, again, uh, during COVID, we started another project, which was digital notary. So we, uh, we got in bed with another partner out of the UK again, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, which was a state run, uh, partly state invested institution. And we started the whole concept of uh, digital notary. Uh, and in Dubai, if you're, if, you know, um, um, in Dubai, it's very simple. If you're part of the public notary, uh, you cannot, uh, public notary will not notarize 
your passport copy or your address verification or stuff like that. So uh, that's the sort of... They won't. Um, they won't. They, they'll notarize documentation, agreements, everything else, mm -hmm. but not your passport copy, right? So a lot of times you have a huge set of uh, expat population that buys homes in Europe or in Asia that need notarized documents. You have company setups uh, out of the Marshall or Cayman Islands or Channel Islands that require whole documentations to be notarized. And all that is a logistical issue right now. So today we've got a couple of uh, private banks that use us. We've got a couple of uh, trust companies that use us for uh, uh, digital notary. Yeah, so it's been tough, but uh, at the same time, uh, the fun part about uh, looking at challenges is that how do you evolve and how do you sort of take a stock of what can be done for future revenues? So that's uh, that's the three uh, you know that's the three layers of Butch Financial for you. Interesting. Um, and we'll come back and we'll kind of throw everyone together. But that's a, uh, again my compliments to you for being proactive during this period. It sounds like it's been great. So Arena, see I'm I'm using pronunciation 2.0. Okay. And I, I, I've, I've known her for years, and thank God she's coming back to to Dubai. Yay! So um, I'm yeah. Um, I think we've met at the uh, first Malta Blockchain Summit, right? That was what feels like 50 years ago, but was probably only like four or five years ago. <laughs> you're, you're, you're dating me a little bit there, because <laughs> <laughs> but any, anyways, tell us your origin story. Tell us how you got involved in the Middle East. Tell us what you're up to these days. Let us go. Let us into it. I, I started my career in oil and gas as, a, mm. as an energy attorney, and I got headhunted to come to Dubai. Um, they, uh, the, company that wanted to, um, the, the company that wanted me to join them had a $11 billion project uh, mm. in, in gas development, developing a gas field. So I knew nothing about um, Dubai or Middle East, but uh, it sounded like a great idea. So I packed my bag, I gave my cat to my mom, uh, and I uh -huh. said, I'll be back in 12 months because it was a 12 month contract. Um, and basically 12 years later, I'm still a resident of Dubai and I still call Dubai home. Uh, because once I have arrived, I didn't want to leave anywhere. Like, why would I go back to Melbourne? Why would I go back to Australia? Mm -hmm. uh, first of all, taxes, you know, nobody likes paying taxes. Uh, so I'm with George here. And second one is weather. I mean, uh, I, uh, Melbourne, anybody who thinks of Australia or spe specifically Melbourne is a nice hot place. It's not. It's freezing. It's raining. It's cold. So Dubai was amazing. Nine months out of the year, it's amazing. So, um, and literally two months ago, I ran away to Switzerland, to Zurich, mm -hmm. because I was so deprived during the uh, Dubai lockdowns, de deprived of, of, of weather and traveling and nature. So I was like, oh, you know what, I'll uh, pack my bag and I'll hang out in, in uh, Switzerland. But Dubai is home, absolutely. So um, now people asking, um, I mean, what's the uh, logical step from oil and gas attorney to being involved in crypto and blockchain and emerging mm -hmm. technologies and AI? And then I ask them, where do you think all these technologies come from? Right. Where do you think the robotics come from? Where do you think the, uh, you know, all the drone technology, uh, machine learning technology, where do you think that all came from? Oil and gas industry um, invests billions and trillions in research and development and oil and gas industry hires most PhD scientists than any other industry. So um, back in 2001, when I first started working for Maersk Oil, one of the first projects was working on a drone that crawls on the seabed and connects pipelines on the seabed so you don't actually send people down there and that was 2001 so we were working on drone technology then so that was 20 years ago that was a generation ago yeah 20 years ago yeah thanks for wow. reminding me. um and uh now drones are all sexy you know you you oh we use drones in doing this we use drones in doing that well Okay, I mean, that's fantastic. Um, also, one of the early projects was um, um, developing um, 
cryptographic protection for SCADA platforms for onshore dr uh, drilling rigs. Mm -hmm. Again, uh, and now cryptography is all suddenly sexy with the introduction of um, blockchain and cryptocurrencies. Um, also, in oil and gas, you drill, you can collect a lot of data, and then this data needs to be analyzed. So what do you need? You mm. need some basic machine learning. You need some you need huge um, computers uh, for the data analytics. Uh, we developed a lot of software, and I was supporting uh, my software teams in developing their software. So that's basically my background, although it was in the oil and gas industry, but I was very heavily exposed to all sorts of technology. And then in 2011, I learned uh, about uh, Bitcoin and I thought, well, that's just, you know, silly internet money for geeks, had mm. uh, zero conviction, had zero understanding even what that was, because uh, let's face it, Bitcoin is not the first go at digital currency or it's at uh, internet currency. There were others that absolutely failed. Uh, so I thought, well, there's just another uh, go uh, for gigs. Um, and then in 2014 or 15, I uh, mm -hmm. was regional general counsel of Maersk, the largest shipping group in the world. And if we all remember, Maersk was one of the first commercial companies that started testing blockchain for commercial applications or for enterprise applications. Um, Sorry, they, and when, when was this? 2014, 2015. They were pretty early for enterprise. That's interesting. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, so they, um, so Maersk sent uh, a container full of roses from uh, somewhere in Africa to a port in somewhere in Europe, and Europe, and the shipment was tracked through blockchain and was uh, registered through the use of blockchain. Uh, I believe they use Hyperledger. Uh, mm. because IBM had to sell their technology to someone, right? Why not? Yes. Let's, you know, it's, uh, uh, you have friends uh, in, in other companies, so that's who you sell it to. So uh, 400 pieces of paper were, um, were not used during uh, the shipment uh, of that container. Mm. So that's how Maersk sort of saw that um, there is, there, is a, there is a use, there is an application. And that's when it clicked for me that Bitcoin and cryptocurrency, it's not just some sort of a speculative asset, but it can also be used for, for industry. And that's how the penny dropped for me back then. And uh, I left Maersk uh, and um, started uh, joined a law firm um, as a partner practicing um, uh, emerging technology law, uh, technology law, and basically digitizing existing companies and in existing industries bringing that emerging technology to them as you can understand if you're a mining or an oil and gas company and you want to introduce some ai technology some machine learning technology some blockchain technology there's so much work to be done uh, mm -hmm. not only from legal point of view but a bit like across the board so that's what i was doing for a while and then i started uh my own uh cryptocurrency exchange with um, a couple of co-founders um, and the reason for that is just really funny. People were coming to my office and they were putting a, a cash on my desk saying, Irina, give me some Bitcoin. I hear about this Bitcoin thing. Give me some Bitcoin. I was like, it doesn't work like this. I don't have Bitcoin in my well, pocket. Well, it, it works that way for some people. <laughs> I don't work that way. I don't yeah. have Bitcoin in my pocket and I do not want your cash. Uh, mm -hmm. Apart from the fact I don't know where it came from. I just completely do not. Do not do not want to get involved in anything like this. In anything like this, so um, I started a, a cryptocurrency exchange with a couple of co-founders, and um, that is uh, now continuing without my um, involvement and my focus now assisting um, emerging technology companies, uh, the founders of emerging technology companies in legally compliant capital formation and legally compliant market entry because it's all fantastic to uh, go to a law firm and to mm -hmm. ask, okay, I wanna do this, what shall I do? And you receive this 50 page memorandum mm -hmm. that even I wouldn't, sometimes I wouldn't even uh, understand what's going on there. And I have a <laughs> tourist doctor degree. Mm -hmm. So imagine you're a founder of an emerging technology company and you get a 50 page memorandum from a lawyer saying, no, you can't do this. No, you can't do this. No, you can't do this. Well, that absolutely does not work instead. Uh, being on both sides of the fence, in-house, in a, as a partner in a law firm, and as a founder of a, of a startup mm. that raised um, millions. So 
I understand that that's not the, uh, uh, the that's that's such an outdated role of a lawyer to give a 50 page memorandum. The, the role of the lawyer is to work with a founder to get them where they want to get. Like, for mm -hmm. example, I'm here. I want to get there. How do we get there? They're not interested. The founders are not interested to receive a 50 page memorandum. They're interested to uh, they're not interested in the process. They're interested in the result. So um, this is what I've been uh, working on throughout uh, the year of 2000 and now. And another quite exciting thing, uh, Nasdaq Dubai has launched emerging markets as a platform for um, SMEs, for emerging companies, for smaller companies to go public. And my firm has been nominated as a um, um, compliance advisor for those wow. uh, for those companies. So basically, anybody want to get listed on uh, uh, Nasdaq Dubai, you're a smaller company, you need to get an, a, a compliance advisor who handholds you through the process. Because your interest is not to go through the process of IPO, your interest is to raise funds. So it's the role of the compliance advisor to make sure we get you there. Uh, developing investor story, uh, roadshows, um, um, uh, recommending law firms to work with, uh, preparing prospectus, etc., etc. So that's quite exciting. It was announced in November 2020. Sounds and... like you've been, sounds great, <laughs> all of it. Yes, so um, that's that's basically very very short about me. That was that was moderately short, <laughs> but that, that, that but it was every it was interesting every step of the way. Thank you so much. So on the invitation for the show, I said mystery guest, you know, number two, three, one. Well, now we get to honor our special mystery guest, no longer a mystery. Uh, Saeed, I, I appreciate you joining this last moment. I know we haven't met before, but you know, everyone I know speaks very highly of you. I'd love to learn about you. Um, and just, I'm gonna hand it to you and tell us about yourself, the, your origin story, what you're involved in, and let us get to know you. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for having me, Gavin. And um, good to see you, George. Good to see you, Irina. Good to see you, Danish. Uh, George has been maybe a year or so, Irina maybe longer, Danish definitely longer again, but it's good to see your face, it's good to see that you're still keeping yourself competitive and, um, you know, hardworking and uh, innovative and, you know, making uh, the right example in the industry that we're in. And I think, um, I think this year is a culmination of the last two years of the bear run where, um, you know, there was a lot of uh, cryptocurrencies that failed um, and the winners right now are those companies that have actually been building and developing and innovating and survived the bear run so I think this is the kind of uh, the start of uh, people that have been building to bear fruit and enjoy the rewards um, maybe I'll, I'll give a bit about my background and you know Please. where I am at the moment so actually my background was um, traditional asset investment. Uh, I used to work for Abu Dhabi Investment Authority, which is one of the largest uh, sovereign wealth funds. Um, so I had a good good sense of the monetary system, um, banking, finance, institutions, uh, all of that uh, was extremely helpful in my career. Um, and then four years ago, um, one of my partners in Alphabet Fund that we set up uh, a few years ago, uh, he called me. He's been a longtime friend of mine, Liam Robertson, um, mm -hmm. and he got in touch. He called me out of the blue, actually, and he said, hey, um, I really want to set up a regulated fund, um, and I want you to be my partner because you have the experience with, uh, with Adia. I said, okay, sure. What's the, what's the asset that you're going to be focused on? And he said, crypto. And I Back then, uh, four years ago, I said, what's crypto? I've never heard of it. And he said, have you heard of Bitcoin? I said, yeah, sure, I've heard of Bitcoin, but you know why Bitcoin was being used on Silk Road and all these negative media, social media you know, kind of posts. But actually, if you think back, that was what made Bitcoin you know, mainstream is, is that uh, use case for it, that actually, hey, it's, it's money on the internet and it's something that you know, uh, can be used for many purposes, but you know, there is a legitimate use case there for it. Um, but then I was just comparing it. Uh, so so Liam just said, OK, uh, you know, I want you to actually look at the fundamentals of it and the facts and then, you know, let me know what you think and if you want to do this. So I said, OK, let me have a let me have a 
look into it, research it uh, for a few days. And to me at the time, you know, I, because of I was familiar with traditional assets and mon monetary system, all of the traditional assets that you know, whether it be real estate, commodities, uh, public equities, private equities, um, they're all somehow linked to the monetary system. So they're all kind of correlated to each other in terms of performance, um, even more so nowadays than, than uh, back when they first started. Um, but then to me, because Bitcoin was an asset that was not linked to any central bank or government, mm -hmm. and it was decentralized, um, to me, it had a correlation that wasn't similar to any other asset classes out there. So in terms of purely just diversifying your asset base, I thought it, it was a no brainer to me. And um, so I called Liam back and I said, hey, you know, uh, yeah, I'm really interested in Bitcoin and uh, let's let's set up the fund to be regulated and invest in crypto assets. And um, so I started, uh, you know, buying Bitcoin and then I started investing in ICOs. Um, and then the fund got set up uh, around June 2017. Um, we started investing in portfolio companies. We started advising companies. Um, Sorry, let me interrupt you one second. So you you have a broad base of you're you're not just investing in crypto. You're investing in actual enterprises that are working in crypto as well, or technology broadly. Correct. Okay. Correct. Okay. Yes. Any any kind of startup that's focusing on blockchain or crypto uh, is uh, you know part of that. Um, universe of instrument that, that I invest in. But mm -hmm. I mean, actually, when I got into crypto, I sold all my other assets. Uh, so that was my, uh, you, you, know, you, you too. I believed in it <laughs> back then. And yeah. I believe in it more so nowadays. I mean, if, if you thought that Bitcoin was going anywhere a few years ago, like if you look at it today, you know that it's, it's, it's not going anywhere anytime soon. And it's only mm -hmm. going to get bigger and stronger because Bitcoin is based on a network effect, right? The more mm. participants, the more users on the network, the stronger it is. Um, arguably, Ethereum is more uh, more secure now because the number of transactions and users on the Ethereum network is super high right now. But I guess mm. that's mainly because of the latest phenomena over the last couple of years of DeFi, decentralized finance. And what most people get confused by with decentralized finance is they think it's, you know, it's some kind of a hype or some kind of thing that's going to go away overnight or over a few months but actually what DeFi is in its true form is you know different companies and different entities trying to compete with uh, banks out there with retail banks and you you know the market cap of all the banks out there in the world and the stock market price of all these banks and mm -hmm. you know they're in several hundred billion dollars mark so DeFi is actually taking away from that big big pie and I think it will be significant in the next well, year. I, I, so I, I, I sorry, let, let me pause you one second because we're already going to get into a good controversial topic. Do you think it's taking away from that market or do you think it's bringing in new market participants? So it's, is, bringing is, in is both. It it's both. It's okay. taken away from that, uh, from those participants and it's also innovating and giving solutions to people who wouldn't have used, you know, uh, or wouldn't have borrowed or lended uh, any of their crypto before. Mm -hmm. if, you own, if you own any like considerable market cap crypto, you're more likely than not lending and borrowing. So, you know, if you look at the market cap of like Aave and Curve and Compound, you know, like it's been phenomenal, the, the no amount of money that's gone into this. So I think once uh, you know DeFi protocols and platforms get to a stage where they're kind of institutional grade and they're very sophisticated, very well developed, very well thought out, mm -hmm. and you're seeing projects come out now that actually solve issues and focus on these um, you know root issues that need to be fixed in the banking system, mm -hmm. um, and I think it's only going to grow, and um, you know crypto is going to grow over the next few years. I mean, look, um, there's there's only one way that Bitcoin is going. If you believe in uh, inflation and the uh, cost of capital, and if you believe in, you know, the fiat money supply that's coming in to be like in the last year, you saw, you know, 75% of the money supply out there in the market today is, was printed in the last 12 months, mm -hmm. which is which is crazy because that's like, that's not sustainable. You know, like it's, it's, it's uh, the monetary system is flawed. And I think, you know, if you looked at the history of money over the last, you know, centuries, they usually have a lifespan of around 100 years. So, you know, the US dollar, as we know it now is nearing that that level. So 
I think there needs to be something to replace it, something more efficient, something trustless, something decentralized. And I think that's what Bitcoin and crypto is. And, um, you know, I, I believe in it uh, wholeheartedly. And uh, I know I, Irina, you know, always uh, talks about Bitcoin in her LinkedIn posts and, you know, encourages other people to learn about it. Mm. And uh, for me, so uh, I'm just an investor. And um, uh, like George maybe would say, I'm a connector as well. And I try to, you know, make sure that the ecosystem is growing specifically in the UAE because that's where, where I'm born and raised and this is where I call home. And I wanted to compete with uh, other developing economies and developed economies and technology is technology an enabler. So, um, so you know, uh, I, I really respect, uh, you know, the ruling kind of family here because they're very much visionaries in line with the original ruler of the UAE and they want what's best for the, for the next generations. And that's one of the mandates of ADIA with our investment authority is there not for the current generations, but all the future generations. And um, I think, you know, the, the, the future generations will most likely, you know, own cryptocurrencies and uh, be much more educated about cryptocurrencies than we are now. I think we're just at the tip of the iceberg and we don't actually see what's, you know, developing on the back end to make these solutions actually viable, easy to use, easy to manage, you know, the, the most, the biggest problem that, uh, you know, people that are new, new to crypto and new to the space is custody. And, you know, they, they, they tend to lose their, um, you know, lose their tokens because they, they haven't, uh, there's no easy to use um, system out there for custody that your average Joe can use, but um, that's improving over time. And, um, you know, I'm, I've, I've seen a lot of projects uh, come through and I'm very excited about the innovation that you're seeing in the, in the space right now. And um, uh, it's very competitive, uh, absolutely. But there's, there's a lot of, um, you know, money out there that's, that's willing to come into the space because they can see the value that they, they can extract over the long term, especially if it's invested in the right things. So I think, you know, my traditional asset background is helped a lot with uh, with blockchain and crypto specifically but um, but you know you have to also have a good range of skill sets to be successful in this space and um, you know you have to have a good people skills and good manage project management skills and all these other different things that you never really kind of use in different uh, careers or different aspects um, but yeah, that's me. And uh, I love the way that I, Irina actually uh, used the oil and gas as the, you know, the root of her getting uh, exposed to uh, emerging technologies and how she got into crypto. But um, yeah. Interesting. Um, and, and it's great to know that you're from there. Um, one thing that struck me when I was there is the very cosmopolitan nature of Dubai and that environment. Uh, Pedro, I think mute yourself if you don't mind. Thank you. The so you you, you and you, you led into the to where I was going to take this conversation. I, I want to thank all our guests for giving their backgrounds and sort of their origin stories. It, it's it's fascinating. I want to lead into the next part, which is evaluating their Emirates as a whole beyond crypto and beyond blockchain. Just the national culture, history, and strategy. If you were describing this environment vis-a-vis -vis other environments and what makes it attractive and maybe where the challenges are still to be met. Um, and you are asking completely non-biased people, right? We're all from there. We love our country so much. Well, I, I, look, look, <laughs> We're completely you, you, non-biased, right? Look, there, there, there's a sampling bias, obviously. But, you know, <laughs> the, like, you know let, let me give you an example. Like, you know, Pedro was kind enough to help me put together or help us put together a Puerto Rico panel last year and they were everyone involved there was a Puerto Rico, and obviously I'm not I'm just analogizing geographical locations not they're the same but the you know they were really straight about its its pros they were straight about what they needed to work on to like take it to the next level and you know when, when you when you love someone you're straight with them because you want them to, to get better obviously joy by is amazing I mean I I, I breathed in the energy you know, to come from Los Angeles, which is in permanent lockdown, where to be honest, you know, you're not sure what's going to happen in the streets and politically the next day, and to go to Dubai and be able to like, ah, it's warm, it's nice, the people are cool, it, it blew my mind. But 
you know, it, it's simply having a vision for the future means that you have a direction, you have things that you still need to do. Otherwise you're done, right? You might as well just go ret retire. So let's say, let me, let me start with you. Just taking Dubai from, I mean, taking the Emirates from the top and from a business cultural locational perspective, if you were describing it to a newbie, how would you do so? Yeah, I think. Well, sorry, let me start with Saeed just because he's okay. from there and, and he kind of led into it a little bit and then I'll, then I'll kind of, then I'll open it up a little bit more. So please. Should we say ladies first, Arena? No, I'll go, I'll go. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, I would say um, the UAE from the from the top down, starting from the people uh, who, who are the rulers of the country, all the way down to uh, citizens and residents, um, you know, and the decision makers above them. I mean, everybody's, you know, going in the same direction and whatever's, you know, uh, being said at the top is after listening into, you know, as many of the people that are trickled down that that system and I believe that you know everybody has a voice and um, everything that's being done in the country is being done to make it um, sustainable, uh, clean, safe, uh, you know, um, a ground where people or an environment where people can grow, can contribute to society. Um, I think the, the UAE people are uh, pretty uh, well educated. Um, they're pretty, uh, you know, uh, proactive when it comes to looking into emerging technologies, embracing uh, emerging technologies. And, you know, the, the best example I can think of is if you look at the Dubai government, they're extremely supportive of blockchain as a technology. And, you know, you, they're pushing their, um, the government entities in Dubai to actually utilize blockchain technology in whatever use case is suitable for them and benefits those government entities. Um, so, you know, from the top down government all the way down to members of the community, I think everybody is in agreement of the vision for the country and everybody wants to do what's best. And, you know, I think um, I think it's the good, really good environment at the moment, especially for blockchain technology. I think, you know, it's it's uh, the ecosystem, the infrastructure, the, the support, um, the maturity of the country, it's it's something where you can actually, you know, do something and create something and be successful with it um, for many years. And, um, you know, I, I'm a big believer in, uh, in the, the progress uh, that's being made at the moment. And I think that progress will continue to, uh, to grow and in the same direction that everybody else in the community wants it to. Interesting. I have to say when I was there, I had, I had a slight Singapore vibe. Again, it, you know, new place for me. So I was kind of, kind of put it in the context. It, it seemed it seemed like a place with a plan as a now I, there's obviously entrepreneurial outgrowths, but there's like some sort of master plan where like it's going somewhere and whether it's the cleanliness of the streets or the the newness of the building and it, and it wasn't new in the sense of put together too fast and you can't trust it i've seen that in some other places it seemed solid and then let me pass it to arena i think you were jumping in there and Give us your give us your impression. You were there for twelve years. You you must have seen a lot. And go for it. Yes, as you can imagine, uh, things have changed. Um, I do not know Abu Dhabi too well. Uh, the only time I was in Abu Dhabi is to have meetings with the uh, Abu Dhabi National Oil and Gas Company, or with uh, others. But I know Dubai very well, and I've seen. Uh, quite, uh, you know, I'll, I'm not as much as Danish and his family, but, you know, in the last 12 years, things mm -hmm. have uh, clearly um, went up and down, up and down. I saw Burj being built and I saw uh, JBR being built. So, mm -hmm. and then at some point I had an office at the uh, top of Burj Khalifa. So I would have never imagined that that's what you can achieve in Dubai. And but, but the, the, the tragedy of my life is you invited me to come to Dubai. I wasn't able to, and you said I could see and use your office. Yeah, yeah, you were absolutely welcome. But you know, you snooze, you lose. That's how it works. You know that. Um, so um, what... I liked what I do like about Dubai and what I love about Dubai. So I was a very, very young lawyer when I came um, uh, over from Melbourne, Australia. And there's no way on earth I would have been put on a 
11 billion dollar project in australia because there's so many white middle-aged men in front of me who wanted to be on that project or who would have been put on that project in dubai you are giving an opportunity um you are okay you want to do that okay here you go do that mm. uh, oh you're doing well fantastic here is more oh you do actually like handling it okay here is more there is no and i'm sorry when you say white middle-aged men you're saying with love and affection right no oh, uh, oh well oh, I, I, tr <laughs> I, I, I tried okay please, please go ahead <laughs> no i'm saying it from you know let's fight the uh patriarchy type of yeah. point all of right all right, right. Okay. 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 Well, she would do very well in puerto rico uh, arena would do well anywhere everywhere anyways go, go ahead so, so you go. so uh and when you uh when you're actually in the middle east and what i get asked all the time is oh my god you're a, a, a white girl from melbourne poor mm -hmm. you how do you manage in the middle east and i look at them in disbelief i was like i've never been hustled i've never been bothered i've never felt disrespected mm -hmm. uh it's that uh, neither from men nor from women neither from locals nor from other foreigners okay if you're somewhere where drunken brits are i mean just stay away from that place because you know it's a it's in their culture to <laughs> bother people mm -hmm. <laughs> no offense to all the nice brits who are watching us i'm talking about the drunken mm -hmm. ones and they the, drunken the, 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 the drunken ones are not watching this show so you don't have to worry about offending <laughs> okay, them good. believe me and yeah. drunken Oz is the same. I mean, I wouldn't go to Bali because that's where the drunken Australians go. I mean, mm -hmm. I have enough of them back in Melbourne. Why would I go to Bali? Um, but what I uh, what I love UAE for is that you have an you, the opportunities are there. Grab onto them, uh, perform to the best of your abilities, and you receive more and more of those opportunities. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's where I went from, you know, a baby lawyer who came to Dubai to becoming, a, you know, regional general counsel in the largest shipping group in the world, mm -hmm. and also a partner in a law firm way before I was um, 35 years old. So would I have been able to achieve that in Australia? I doubt very much so, because it's a very settled and like it takes time to go through the motions. But in, when you're in this growing economy in this growing place you can grow with that as well um and that's what i personally took out of dubai well so let also, me jump in for, for someone approaching it now in 2021 do you think it presents the same rapid growth open opportunities that it did when you arrived has it has the flavor changed over time of course, what, what of course do you think? things have changed. Of course, things have changed, and uh, of course, things have changed for sure. I mean, you are not the same person today as you were the per person last week, uh, but mm. I still feel that your is the land of the opportunity. I still feel that entrepreneurial spirit. And when uh, when you talk about when when I when I describe your if I were to describe your to somebody who's never been there, I see it being run as an enterprise. And mm -hmm. let me explain. Let's say you work for a large multinational corporation. Mm -hmm. each, each individual contributes somehow, otherwise what you're doing there. And each individual, uh, and there is a HR department that tells you like work out, eat healthy, stop being fat, lazy, because our insurance premium are going up. And I see the same going in Dubai. Like every year we have uh, 30 days of fitness challenge launched by um, Royal Prince. He wants people to wake, uh, work out. People are encouraged to work out. There's all the free classes. So this, okay, we are the members of the corporation. Let's try to <laughs> be healthy. There's a lot of free schools, for example, for, for, for local uh, um, population and say, please correct me if I'm wrong, the education is free. I mean, you can go very, very far in educating yourself. Um, uh, the same if you work for a corporation, there's free courses, free this. People actually encourage you to go and study. There is a lot of entrepreneurship programs sponsored by the government. Um, and the same if you work for a corporation, people oh, like actually hire... do me a favor, pause on that one for a second because the when when I see plant, you know, there's planned communists and there's like planned capitalists and, you know, Dubai, like I mentioned, sort of fits in my slot somewhere also with sort of Singapore model. This, I, I have a slight impression of as, as a top-down innovative society, but 
talk about talk about the grassroots entrepreneurial culture and, and how that's supported by the government and then anyone else who wants to, anyone from the panel who wants to jump in and comment on that also uh, um, i welcome i i yeah uh, planned uh Capitalism, I think it's a very good description and planned not for now, but also planned for later because um, we're going to run out of oil one day or Tesla Sun batteries will uh, take over the market. Yes, mm -hmm. UAE had huge boost from the oil sales, it's still having huge boost from the oil sales where the, that's where the, that's where Adia, so Adia takes the money uh, from um, the, one of the largest sovereign wealth funds, Mobadala and Adia. So they're taking money from the oil sales and from other revenue and they're reinvesting it in emerging technology, in biotech, in the hospitals, and in, in health, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. They, they're diversifying as much as they can because they understand oil is for now, but mm -hmm. the well, the wealth of the generation needs to stand and need to be, uh, uh, need to stay within the country. And this is absolutely opposite to what is happening, for example, in Australia, which I absolutely hate. Rio Tinto, BHP, um, all these huge mining giants, they're digging things out, selling it to um to china thank you very much okay we paid some taxes to australia minimum mm. taxes and that's what's happening for example in 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 russia that's where my family um heritage is is from mm -hmm. from eastern europe uh selling uh selling oil the rich getting richer and rich not 10 percent or 20 percent rich zero 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 point one percent getting richer from that oil revenue and the rest of the population can just go to hell you know it doesn't matter what it doesn't matter what's going to happen the uae has absolutely opposite approach yes we've got some oil now we've got some other revenue now but we keep it we reinvest it for the future generations to to have uh, um you know a meaningful participation in the society and that's you have to admire the leaders and this is not some sort of a uh, uh, <laughs> politically correct talk you have to admire the uae leaders and people generally, residents uh, and nationals generally love their leaders because the leaders actually mean well for them. They're not trying to, you know, stuff their pockets like what's happening in Eastern Europe, for example. They're, they're, and, and actually, let me pause there for a second. The, the, my, when, I, when I was there and walking around and hearing all this, I'm gonna be real straight. Part, part of me is, you know, is this the party line because it's a hereditary right. monarchy? You know, is this like for show? Is it a Potemkin village? Is, I, 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 I didn't have a sense of it yet, but then it, it felt more and more legit as I talked to people. It's a party line. I know, it was interesting. I'm like, oh, it really is for real. Because you know you don't you don't necessarily know that from the outside, but when you're there, it's neat. Sheikh, like, Mohammed, Sheikh Mohammed drives his own car by himself, no security, and when he walks on JVR walk and I ran across him a couple of times, right? Mm. You run across the ministers and the prime ministers, you run across, uh, uh, you know, the leaders of the state or of the country. And they just, you know, they say hello. And I mean, would that happen anywhere else? Like where, like, would you no. see Biden right now walking down the street and shaking hands and saying hello to people? Forget about- I, I, I'm uh, not sure Biden can actually walk. Forget about Corona. It's yeah. you know. Uh, forget about the the, the the situation. Just in general, of course they wouldn't do that because they are not really uh, um, you know you know some people are quite unhappy with all of them. You know whichever side you take, there'll be somebody unhappy about you. Sure. But you don't see that in the UAE, and it's such a safe country. That's another thing. Like I'm in I'm in uh, Switzerland now, right outside of Zurich. But I will not run. And uh, we've got a beautiful forest just there, and I run every day, five to seven kilometers. Uh, I would not run after dark. I would not go running after dark, even though it's Switzerland. In Dubai, I never thought for a second about personal safety or security. And that's, as a, as a woman, uh, that's quite a big uh, plus. Interesting, so let, let's pass it to George. Um, George, yes. you're, 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 you know, as mayor of Dubai, uh, you're, 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 you're very approachable. You obviously are a, a sort of a social networker and connector. You, you started the uh, EXO Dubai, if I'm saying that correctly? Echo X. thank you. It's which to me kind of symbolizes that despite the, the, the fact that it's a planned form of capitalism coexists with an element of entrepreneurial social networking grassroots creation. It seems to have successfully 
melded these two aspects. Can you, in, in broad strokes, beyond crypto and beyond blockchain, sort of describe the business environment in UAE and maybe draw a distinction between the different Emirates, if there is one, if yeah. there's like, and please go ahead. Yeah. Uh, first, um, I think it's important to note that although Dubai uh, is pushing the envelope more than the other Emirates, there's actually seven Emirates. And uh, obviously Abu Dhabi plays a key role in allowing Dubai to do what it does. And I, I would go even beyond that. I would say that the whole GCC itself is an ecosystem. Mm. Uh, Dubai was able to go from 250,000 population to 4 million, not just because of Dubai, because uh, it's become an echo center for the region. So people will go a Sunday morning to Saudi and do some consulting work and come back um, home on Thursday night. So many things have happened in Dubai that the country is actually run like a business, number one, which was already highlighted by a few, but it, it's much more than that. Uh, the leaders make a key role in pushing the envelope. So you have to look a little bit of Dubai as like almost like a franchise in the sense that um, there's some key elements and there's maybe about 10 of them that mm -hmm. make uh, Dubai unique. Um, one is obviously the safety and the security. Uh, number two is the infrastructure that gets put in place by creating a smart city. So this goes beyond a safe city. And what this allows you to do is uh, uh, to have all the necessary elements, whether you move around and you automatically have access to a lot of the functions through smart apps and so on. Mm. Uh, beyond these uh, two or three out of the 10 key elements that make Dubai, the metro, uh, the infrastructure that gets put in place, there's some key elements that are extremely important um, as well, which is the capability of allowing a startup culture to take place. If we went back to Dubai 25 years ago, it was not that. It was uh, one tall building the, on close to Sheikh Zayed Road at the beginning called the World Trade Center. Most people cannot imagine this was the tallest building 25 years ago. So that uh, Burj Khalifa, a lot of things had to happen and a lot of innovative things that to happen in taking. And one of the things that Dubai is very good at doing is it goes to other cities in other countries, whether it is Singapore, whether it's Las Vegas, and it takes the idea and improves on it, makes it better, makes it longer, makes it uh, bigger, etc. Uh, but beyond that, if you look at the whole GCC as an ecosystem, um, all these countries compete with each other and also help each other to some extent. You know, you mm -hmm. have the shopping festival, started in Dubai, but then everybody else has got their also shopping festival as well. And you have obviously Saudi Arabia being the biggest of all the cousins in the area. So things that get done in Dubai, they have to be done in Saudi Arabia 10 times bigger. And that includes the tallest tower and so on. So everybody's trying to compete with one another. So this competition- I, I, Actually, sorry, let, let me ask you something. Is Dubai in some sense an area where ideas get prototyped and then maybe adopted by the wider GCC? Is there any sort of that dynamic in place or is that overstating it? Well, some of the ideas. I, I mean, one example that Dubai is pioneer uh, and this is quite important. It's one of the first places in the world where you have a minister of AI. So people have realized that today data, not just blockchain is a key element of society and how you extract value from data. Definitely the way to do this as we move forward is artificial intelligence. So, so by allowing um, Ministry of Artificial Intelligence, what you're really doing is creating focus on that specific area. And this creates a whole new generation of startups, innovation uh, of ideas to things that are quite unique. Let me just give you a simple example. Today in Dubai, there is one of the startups that does, for example, uh, claim insurance. So for example, when you have a car accident, you can actually go and take uh, two, three, four pictures of the car and the pictures of the car are used to determine the insurance claim amount or what is the, uh, the damage to the car. So all this is done through artificial intelligence. So that really means that by pushing the envelope of what you can do with data, you're able to provide better government services uh, and more innovative. Uh, but a lot of it still remains ahead. I, I think there's many areas where um, Dubai uh, needs to improve. And for example, one of the areas definitely is in the area, for example, of usage of green energy. 
Uh, mm. uh, and this is obviously because of the nature of the Middle East, uh, things like uh, desalination and other procedures today um, use too much energy. So we need to look for better and more efficient ways to, by using technology, uh, to, to make the, the ecosystem completely self-fulfilling, mm -hmm. you know, to, to have an end-to-end -end, uh, innovation uh, in that. Um, and overall, I, I do believe that because of all these elements are in place in Dubai, people go and uh, they feel safe, they thrive. And uh, not only that, uh, if you look at, for example, Emirates uh, Airlines, which came out of nowhere by borrowing um, two airplanes from Pakistan Airlines. <laughs> you know, they didn't have their own airplanes. Mm -hmm. you know, at wow. the time it was Gulf Air was the carrier of the Gulf. So they became the largest carrier in the world. So it requires vision. It requires uh, risk taking. Uh, some decisions are good. Some decisions sometimes. Sorry, did, did, I hear, did I hear that correctly? I knew Emirates was huge, but is it the largest carrier in the world? With the largest, yes, yes, it became the largest carrier in the world in terms of uh, airplanes, in terms of landings and takeoffs from overnight. So not only that, it allowed you from Dubai to connect 140, 150 countries. And I'm talking pre-COVID. I mean, post-COVID, of course, there has to be some adjustments and maybe some of the decisions sure, sure, sure. about size of airplane need to be adapted to the new reality, but uh, they move and they innovate fast in terms of, for example, um, although I used to fly every day of the week uh, previously, and since the beginning of last year, I have maybe five flights, but you know, they introduced uh, hygiene mechanisms and tests to make sure that it became safe again. So at least to build some confidence ba back into the system. If you look now, for example, at the COVID uh, pandemic, uh, I think Dubai is probably, or UAE as a whole, let's not just say Dubai, it's probably number two in the world in terms of uh, speed at which they're vaccinating the entire population. So if you do these kind of actions, that means you allow and you operate as a business. That means you're able to get the population to go back to work as quickly as possible rather than to, to lose um, productivity uh, in, in the infrastructure and in the environment. Interesting. Uh, let, let me pass it to Danish, if I may. You know, you, I, you, you also have this sort of expatriate experience. You've also seen it develop over time and I you think you probably have a pretty good sense of where it's heading. I'd, I'd love to give your impressions of Dubai specifically, but then the Emirates and the various Emirates generally, just let, let us know your thoughts. Yeah, so I'm, I'm, um, I'm going to try and keep it short. Um, so as you know, whether my father came in 1970 or uh, the family started doing stuff in the 80s or I started working in the 92, in the 90s, or I came back and we established something in uh, 2012, um, Dubai has always had a culture of evolution. It constantly evolves. Right. And uh, it's not that the opportunities were very different at then. The, the people evolve, the opportunity evolves, the landscape evolves. Right. So everything changes. Right. The opportunities today are, are, are evolving as well. In the next 10 years, the opportunities will evolve further. Uh, the landscape will evolve. And we as individuals will evolve to identify those opportunities. I can't see anything static in Dubai if that's the right way to mention it, mm -hmm. right? Nothing is there that, uh, that reminds you of the past. Slowly and steadily, you forget how Dubai was. You only remember them in pictures and postcards and the Facebook posts, right? Uh, and, and that's about it. And that's one of, and that represents how the government thinks as well. So if you look at, uh, if you look at the nimble attitude of the government or the, or the advantages of that attitude, is they evolve faster than anyone else. And they forecast what's going to happen into the future. And that's why they take a stance of being proactive. Whether it's technology driven, whether it's GCC infrastructure driven, we have the better tech infrastructure within the GCC. We've created an environment for everybody, every multinational who wants to service the GCC to be headquartered in Dubai, right? At the same time, we are, you know, with the good comes the bad, right? So there are elements that, you know, one of the biggest, all the scams come out of Dubai as well, right? 
everybody who's trying to con somebody comes to Dubai trying to find free money. So, you know, the, the landscape- uh, Actually, that's an interesting like, question. The scams come, I mean, just be, I appreciate you being real straight about it. The <laughs> scams come from Dubai or the scamsters come to Dubai? They come to Dubai because okay. uh, nobody in their right mind would actually have a homegrown uh, scam over here. Dubai is a police town, right? Everybody mm -hmm. knows everybody. It's not that difficult. But then again, you have these, um, you know, you have these expats that come in and try to set up institutions or uh, cyber uh, or cyber access or something mm -hmm. or the other trying to scam you out of money, right? Uh, or they come up with projects that can't be delivered or something or the other keeps happening. But, but having said that, um, the government is very secure in what they want to do and with whose money they want to do it with and mm -hmm. how their repayment plan is set up. Um, between the UAE, we issue a lot of debt, but then so does the complete GCC. There was a time when, when the UAE ran a surplus mm -hmm. uh, in the 80s. Today it runs a deficit because obviously somebody's told them how to run a deficit-run economy that would benefit them into the future. Right? Uh, let's, let's, you know, let's not forget that uh, as an institution, uh, Dubai has done wonders, right? And uh, today, even when you are at the forefront of uh, technology, whether you're talking blockchain integration models or you're talking new uh, startups and adoption of new technology, crypto wasn't on, uh, on the scene for quite mm -hmm. some time, mm -hmm. right? So you had, even now, when you look at uh, ADGM and the uh, exchanges that are set up, the crypto exchanges that have been set up, they still haven't been launched. So that's in the phase of happening, or some of them have been, but most of them have been given green light. I think Saeed can uh, uh, give further um, uh, light on that. Uh, but there is an issue with Dubai looking at crypto, right? So uh, crypto friendly assets or exchanges have come to Abu Dhabi, not Dubai, right? You can start up a, that's a, DIFC, okay. a DIFC based uh, a startup in an innovation hub or anything else, but you can't do crypto assets. Banks are still not opening crypto bank accounts, right? Mm. So there is an adoption that's waiting to happen. Uh, I'm, 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 you know, I would like to see how this progresses now that uh, there is a mainstream requirement and investment by such large corporates into the crypto market. I want to see how Dubai, uh, you know, takes takes hold of that. Interesting, fascinating, yeah. and, and it, it, uh, interesting distinction between Abu Dhabi and Dubai when it when it comes to this aspect. I. I'm, I'm, again, getting my sense of the of the different Emirates, I somehow have Dubai as a little bit more public relations or flashy in my mind. I don't even know if that's true, but well, it's, it's, Dubai, it's, Dubai is you know it's just like every capital and every metropolis, right? If hmm. you uh, if you look at uh, Washington versus New York, you look at uh, uh, Delhi versus Bombay or Karachi versus Islamabad, hmm. or you know anywhere in the uh, there's a there's a business model and there's a capital model. Right mm -hmm. over here, both those models are pretty energetic and uh, and evolving pretty close to each other. So if if I look at the seven Emirates, uh, so Abu Dhabi holds the key to the uh, oil reserves, Dubai holds the key to tourism. Mm -hmm. Right, Dubai has uh, has promoted itself in terms of infrastructure, availability, accessibility, uh, financial capital. Abu Dhabi has pr promoted themselves as the investor, as and they're setting up different units of uh, attracting new businesses, technology driven and everything else, right? So these are two different sections right now. Uh, people should view them as one and then choose what makes them uh, advantages at, in which, uh, in which uh, hub from that perspective, right? Uh, nobody's going to go to Sharjah, Ajman, Ras Al Khaimah, uh, Fujairah, Khurfa Khan, Alain. You know, nobody's heading that way yet, which is the Northern Emirates, right? Uh, but there, 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 I hear, sir, sir, just from a tourism perspective, is if you want to see a glance at t traditional Emirates culture, that's a place to go. Is that accurate? Yeah, so I would, I would definitely do, uh, you know, uh, the south part of the, the UAE, whether it's uh, Sharjah, Ajman, mm -hmm. Ras Al Khaimah. Uh, you know, they still have those uh, cultural aspects available, right? The, and and you can see it uh, how it was versus how it's become. There's a pretty di distinct, uh, uh, you know, differentiation. Even in uh, Dubai and Abu Dhabi, there are areas that are still recognized as the downtown or the heritage sites, where mm -hmm. they've kept just for tourism, right? Especially in Dubai. So yeah, I think if, if you ask me what, how does it look like for the next uh, 10 years? Uh, socially, I think, uh, you know, there's, there's, there's a terminology which says, uh, uh, for, for business perspective, right? It says 
constituted independence right Oops. and disciplined liberalism disciplined liberalism interesting okay so this is how i see uh, you know dubai and abu dhabi or the uae going forward for the next uh, 10 years you know you you've got to have some discipline and you've got to have some constitution of independence right and and uh, this is what we get over here which is a great mix of uh, of uh, legality of uh, ownership and of uh, a lifestyle that you won't get anywhere else i mean forget about the taxes you know there there you know uh, there's nothing called a, a free lunch right so there mm -hmm. there are there are taxes that are inbuilt the cost of living or what you pay as an expat uh, you know that's happening all over the world so there are indirect taxes everywhere in the world i don't think there's a free lunch anywhere but uh, uh, from from the surface level i think it's a great place we've been here for 50 years my kids are here i think uh, their kids will be here if they don't decide to do anything productive and eat off the family pot but i guess that's it well yeah i, I think as a good dad you're going to hold them accountable um th that's fantastic so we're going to get to part 2 of the show um uh, we, we're lucky that we have a lot of alumni speakers that are joined us a lot of familiar faces a couple new faces i want to sort of open this up to the bandstand um if someone wants to drop a question in the chat or you know i think i think i pretty much know almost everyone if, if you want to unmute your, if you want to show your faces and raise your hands and you know I'm, I'm gonna pick on someone to start because he he's always with us and i appreciate it oh actually alexi Alexi with the awesome headgear. I, I'm going to go to you first. Uh, Alexi he recently made his acquaintance, very smart crypto oriented individual and please go for it. Hi again. Uh, my question is about regulations uh, in Dubai uh, according to artificial intelligence. Yes, uh, it's one of the most uh, liberate and innovative um, jurisdictions for uh, technologies, including artificial intelligence. But uh, we all know uh, the fabulous case of uh, Google and the libraries. Uh, if uh, you don't know, I'll uh, say it uh, in a couple of words. When Google was starting to build its uh, Google Translate system, they have uh, started to analyze uh, all the books, all the heritage from libraries, uh, storages, etc., uh, human writing texts, so they will be able to make a really uh, human-like translator and a human-like text understanding. They did it. but. Uh, before they started to release it to the search uh, results and etc it was a big uh, lawsuit that uh, almost uh, totally prohibited them from using the results of this uh, great scientific work so my question is uh, what's uh, not the current state but uh, the uh, currents that are driving uh, regulations of data and data set acquisition and usage in artificial intelligence in dubai it's actually a very um, important uh, question for technology nowadays in my opinion. Yes, um, I, I can um, answer part of that. Uh, one thing that is extremely important in Dubai is that um, they, they passed um, a data law some time ago. And uh, this data law is about a little bit over two years old. And it applies both to government and to business. And what it does is it forces both government and business to open their data. It does not mean they have to open their confidential data or private data could be like uh, healthcare or so, but at least the statistical data. And this enables actually Dubai to, by generating a lot more larger amounts of useful data to make better decisions in the future while at the same time uh, still having uh, protection. As was highlighted by uh, another of the speakers as well earlier, um, Danish, um, Dubai is a, a police safety state. That's why it is very safe. Everything is controlled by cameras and um, the government and the police knows everything that happens at every minute of the day. That's why, although there is crime, it is relatively small. And when there's crime, it gets solved relatively fast. So for example, these cameras now have been enhanced uh, to provide additional information about um, the health associated with COVID, when face recognition and, and other mechanisms to enable things like, for example, contract tracing in case uh, there's uh, something associated with an infection due to the pandemic. So it, it allows uh, Dubai to be much more safe in this relationship. And that really means that by doing that, it uh, is able to advance much faster as a society and help the local citizens as well as the expats 
that actually live in Dubai and provide a, a much healthier environment. Uh, one other interesting aspect that I did not touch, but, but it was also quite unique. I talked about AI. Uh, Dubai did realize a few years ago that people were getting anxious about living in Dubai or sometimes in the region. So they ended up in creating what's called today as the minister of happiness. How many countries or places in the world do you know there's actually a minister of happiness? And what we may laugh about it, but it was actually quite a, a serious undertaking because the objective was again to collect a whole amount of service satisfaction data and then being able to improve the services that are being delivered to the citizen, whether these services are being delivered by the bank or by the national transportation system or usually known as the RTA or Road Transport Authority or any other government services. What was born almost overnight is the capability of collecting all this statistical information almost everywhere in the country. There was a you know, sad face, medium face, happy face. And for every service that was conducted by almost any department, you had the chance to reply and the government is then able or the private industry to use this data to improve their services. So it's forcing, and I want to address one other aspect that I think Danish also covered a bit earlier. One thing that makes Dubai unique, it's the agility of the government. That means uh, many people have criticized, oh, Dubai is going to collapse again because of the financial situation. No, Dubai is capable always of self-innovating and the government is capable of innovating at a much faster pace than other parts of the world, because in most parts of the world, governments are bureaucratic and they move extremely slow. So by looking at the data and understanding the risks and then making decisions faster, they're able to kind of redesigning Dubai uh, periodically at, from time to time by introducing new products, by introducing new services, by looking at things that were not there before and therefore being more innovative. Uh, I just want to add one more thing to it. There, there, we have a ministry of uh, possibilities in Dubai, uh, which is a collaboration between uh, uh, state, private, and local government, right? The minister of uh, possibilities can, uh, uh, can access and bring together three of those elements in, uh, in total totality, just to ensure that there is a solution um, going forward. Anyway, Irina, uh, please, all yours. Uh, yes, I'm just, um, I don't, I don't want the people who are listening from the outside to think, you know, Dubai is a magical place and everything is so fantastic. And uh, why am I in, in, in Switzerland then uh, at the moment? So I don't want people to get that false uh, idea that, every, or that we all probably think that we're seeing the world through rose glasses or something. There are, of course, challenges. I mean, there's a lot to see. Good, a lot of good things to say, but there's also challenges. You know, long-term uh, Dubai residents cannot get um, a citizenship within the country. So what that means, that means you you sort of don't feel that this is your home, although you've been there for 12 years. And that's why, you know, I got my permanent residency now here. So in a couple of years, uh, I'll get my passport. You know, I'm happy. I'm happy to pay taxes. I'm happy to contribute to, to this country. So... There's, of course, there's, uh, there's challenges, you know, there is no free speech, uh, which, um, you know, if you want to stand uh, in the US with the poster and say that Biden is not a good person or Trump is not a good person, you're absolutely free to do so. You cannot do that in the UAE. There's uh, um, no protesting on the streets. Um, whether it's a good thing or a bad thing, everybody should decide for themselves. Mm -hmm. um, so there's uh, um, quite restrictive uh, um, in, in, in terms of expression as well. So don't, I don't want people to think that we got paid by Dubai government <laughs> to sell how amazing it no, is. How amazing it is. There is, there are, uh, there are uh, not so great things about the UAE. Um, for example, there were a lot, and not just the UAE, but GCC in in glo in in broader sense, there were a lot of claims for the um, when the um, when they when Qatar was building their stadiums, there were a lot of claims that workers were being um, 
abused and not paid and not treated properly. So FIFA had to interfere and demand for, you know, some sort of a human rights committee for the workers. So there's quite issue, quite a few issues in the GCC. And um, uh, in some uh, countries, for example, there's, you know, there are restrictions and restraints on women doing business, women setting up an account, but all of uh, driving, for example, Saudi, but all of that slowly, but certainly going away mm. and the countries are becoming more open and more uh, welcoming to, to sort of like more democratic, not even democratic, uh, more libertarian approaches. Um, Actually, let me jump in there for a second. It feels like there's an authoritarian layer on the governmental plane, but when it comes to personal liberties and personal expression, there's a slow evolution. Is that reasonable? no? Yeah, there's not allowed. Mm -hmm. um, with the, um, I mean, things are not allowed. For example, in in some uh, countries, and then those people uh, who are speaking up are going away. Of course, none of that is happening in the UAE, not at least to my knowledge. Um, or there's, uh, uh, you know, another extreme was happening in the U.S. and the uh, and the protests and shops are being burned down and and uh, capital is being uh, um, broken into. So that's, I mean, I mean, it just depends. <laughs> Is there a country with a good um, sort of good balance of that? I don't know. Yeah, yes, you're in it. In Switzerland, yes, yes, that's that's perfect. For yeah. example, you, you Canada, just you just have a weather issue. <laughs> no, it's amazing. I'm actually looking outside. It's snowing. Mm -hmm. We we have a snowstorm today. It's gorgeous. It's absolutely stunningly gorgeous. So weather is not an issue. That's because you're warm uh, inside. Oh. <laughs> I just came back from a five kilometer run in the forest under the snow. So it was amazing. Was um, so what, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Switzerland is, uh, is, 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 is a, a strange democracy where every person actually has a say. For example, in capital of years, when I'm due for my citizenship, my neighbors get to vote whether they get one or not. So I have to be very nice to my neighbors. Oh my gosh. I, you, you, since I want to... Since I want to move there, that's a good little tip. I need to be nice to my neighbors. So <laughs> well, let, let, let me yeah. let, let me let, let I, me. I, I, I actually, I'm, as I'm listening to you guys, right, and I'm hearing about all the all, all the beautiful parts. About Pedro, the Pedro, if you're going to talk, I want to see your smiling face. Oh, okay, okay, okay. I was actually a little busy. Let me come outside and see. Um, and, and then yeah, we're going yeah. to Sergey. So I, I actually said like um. You know, I'm listening to you guys, and I, I think it's dope, like what you guys got going on in, in, in United Arab Emirates. But I got to be honest, I'm, I'm a little concerned with the amount of, 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 you know, like when he said, like, you know, the contact tracing that was instituted to the cameras and all the amount of technology. You know, I've been to Dubai a couple of years ago. I can't remember. It was, I think it was 18 or 17. I'm not sure. Um, and that's what I thought about it while I was there. I was like, you know, like, you know, this looks like Demolition Man. And I can imagine, you know, like how easily we, and obviously the leaders of Dubai, and this is also something I was thinking about while you were speaking, Saeed, you know, how you was praising the leaders, the leaders of Dubai. And, you know, generally speaking, people of your wealth don't really care for, you know, the government, you know? So, I, you know, at first I was thinking maybe, you know, the brothers got some business with the government, you know, and wants to make them look good. But then everyone else was saying the same thing. And it made me interesting that that's probably why it's not a problem that you have that kind of, control with technology and it hasn't gone south but what happens in 20 years from now when the next you know let's just say i believe the way the leadership runs is is through heritage right let's just say the king's you know kids or whoever's in line to take the throne let's just say he's not such a good person and he decides to use all that power and control and go the opposite way with it what would dubai look like then i, I, Zahid, I guess you're on the hot seat what, what do you think the, the benevolent point. dictator right uh <laughs> paradox yeah, I mean that's that's uh, that's one of the cons of uh, of a monarchy, right? You know, uh, it's uh, if if somebody who's takes takes power is um, not uh, not going to look after the the people of that country, right? So there's always a risk there. But I think the culture and the traditions and the visions of the of the ru ruling family in general are are built in such a way that it's hopefully going to carry on over the generations so um so yeah it's, it's all about you know education and raising the, the next generation in the correct way and maintaining traditions maintaining your culture and 
you know, your morals and values and ensuring that um, the next generation that takes power has actually got the, the right, you know, fundamentals and grounding and, and um, history lessons and been taught the right things and, and it passes over from generation to generation. So yes, that could be a, an issue, but um, I hope that, um, you know, things in the long-term future are, are as they are now or even better and um, but it's a valid point that you raise. Well, let me, let, me throw, let me throw this out here just, and again, I'm a neophyte, but I, I think in terms of, look, we've we seen in the United States, we've seen the deterioration of our institutions recently. So there, it's, it's, it's hard to know what exactly keeps uh, the ship of state on an even keel over the long term. My thought about the Emirates is be, because it has a large, expatriate population because it's open in international trade and because it's in a geopolitically tenuous yet advantageous position there's a lot of sort of subsurface things pushing it towards mo towards moderating any kind of worse instincts because the economy seems to be so much based on external talent and innovation and and trade just for geopolitical reasons. I mean, it could kind of lock up into itself, like be in North Korea, but then it would basically be letting go of all this wealth. So I, I, th I think I think there's some restraints on the, the negative side. Like, I don't, I don't think it could fall too far without giving up everything that made it successful. So I, that gives I, I me... think that is a, an important thing about Dubai that is also about the whole region. Um, apart uh, from the wealth that actually came from oil, Mm -hmm. uh, and apart from the people that may be from a royal family, there's people that are not royal family that are extremely successful either in Dubai, Bahrain, Saudi, Kuwait, or Qatar. Mm -hmm. And these are basically local people, locals, not foreigners, that started their own businesses. So either they were traders or they got into real estate or they were running successful businesses. And they established under this umbrella a complete uh, successful business. For example, if we look at the place like Saudi Arabia, there's a guy named Sheikh Al Ramazan. Mm -hmm. It's nothing to do with royal family. However, he became extremely successful both in technology as well as in gold training, trading. So, uh, in all these countries, there is specific individuals that are also setting the tone for what happens in the country. Uh, one comment regarding what happened be before about the question. Mm. Um, monarchy by itself is not necessarily a problem by, um, because in the case even of uh, um, what they call democratic countries, you could have a good democracy and a bad one. So one ruler elected did a good thing for the country, the next guy comes after it, destroyed everything. Mm. I think we have seen this without naming the specific countries. Uh, and uh, what this really does is that means you have to be in the business or in the idea of serving the people and, and if the, um, the right intention is there, then a good success comes out of it. And the good success comes that it actually makes the ruler even more rich than he was before. So don't, don't get my thing wrong. <laughs> he actually benefits from the whole thing actually being a success in the end anyway. Phil, if you look at, uh, if you look at the uh, uh, complete population of the UAE, uh, UAE has uh, 8.45 million expats currently, right? And uh, if you look at uh, the size of the sovereign wealth funds that have grown over the last uh, uh, 30 years is exponential. So there has been a lot of uh, advantages for the local population by having the expat community. And let's not forget, we are in the second generation of leadership in any case, which has done tremendously well uh, from the first, taking forward the same mantle, uh, whether it's... Uh, 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 whether it's Mohammed bin Zayed or it's uh, Sheikh Mohammed. And if you see the uh, grooming of the next generation is in line with that. So, you know, as, as, uh, as, uh, as expats living in Dubai with Indian nationality for the last 50 years, uh, we're not uh, concerned as say as much as maybe others are on, uh, on the continuity of uh, the leadership. I was, about to, uh, I was about to add the same, Danish. When, uh, when we look at the uh, crown princes coming up, we love crown princes even more. They're cool, they're young, they're instituting you know, more you know, interesting policies, 
pushing for technology and for sports. So whether you're an, uh, an expat living in Dubai, you actually love the uh, the crown prince even even more. Forget about the fact that he is super handsome. It's just um, uh-huh. you see that you see that trend. Mm. Uh, the second generation uh, taking the values and doing more, and we. I have no doubt that they, the current crown princess will take all those values and push and do better things for, for, for the people. But then, of course, uh, you know, nothing is guaranteed in, in life, right? So, fair, fair enough. Let, let me let me shift sli- your slide there. I want to welcome Sergey onto the show. Um, this is just a brief interjection. Uh, Sergey and I are collaborators. He has a great series that's based in CIS, you know, ex Russian. Uh, ex-Soviet space, I should say. I don't even know how to describe it. You just have a very wide group and we've been collaborating on a bunch of shows and he was nice enough to join us and I think he would probably like to have a Dubai show also. So Sergey, I just want to give you a moment to introduce yourself and if you have a question through or out there, but otherwise just say hello and I want to give you the spotlight for a moment. Thanks a lot. My huge greetings to all these think tank people look I don't know, lo- looking around me, I see that so many distinguished persons really coming in one place, not in Dubai yet, even here in virtual space, here in Zoom, but I think all of us are going to be there. I am now speaking from the snowy and very cold place called Moscow, but to be frank, I'm looking to be in the center of the planet because Dubai positioning itself at real center of the planet, center of the innovation, center of the places where the people might combine in one place. My huge pleasure to that country. I see so many smiles and, and I feel that they are <laughs> yeah, We need to hire you as the spokesperson. No, Sergey Ser- 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 and I have like the same <laughs> energy level. You know, we're, we're just like, yeah. So, Said, yeah. can we get him a job in a PR team? <laughs> yes, for sure. You know, guys, what I see that now we're not going to find the oils of the earth, not trying to find out the oil from there. Now the oil is out here. The humans are now the smart people, the think tank humans, which are making these technologies happen and they are going to innovation and they're able to bring all of that to the humanity. They are going to the the best places of this planet. And I think that Dubai is one of them. That's why much huge respect to all of you and looking for you being there in very short time. Yes, I'm on my flight in two days. Sergey, really appreciate it. And Sergey's helping me like everyone else very slowly to improve my Russian. So, um, thank you. So let, let, let me pass it to our perennial speaker and guest, Marco. Hey, Gordon. And, hey, and, everybody. And, and you're in the Caymans where it's warm, like in Dubai. Ah, but go ahead. Yes, I miss Dubai. I lived there from uh, fall of uh, 99 to spring of 20, uh, 2002, um, working at a startup down there. Um, but originally, actually, I got there through Microsoft. So um, I showed up uh, just before Y2K. Uh, and yes, Gordon, it was planned. I figured if Y2K, you know, 1% chance w- turned out real bad, I did not want to be anywhere that was snow covered. That's smart. Okay. <laughs> so um, my take on Dubai was interesting. I actually didn't mind the whole, you can't get a citizenship there. That doesn't really bother me. Citizenship in and of itself is useful to have, obviously, uh, in our world, but uh, you don't necessarily have to be a citizen of where you are. I've never really felt that was a, a problem. Um, now, that could be a little bit biased. I have a Canadian passport, a British passport, and a French passport, mm-hmm. so I can get almost anywhere in the world visa-free. Um, but I did uh, find that Dubai is a place where you can get a lot done very quickly, slowly. Inshallah, bukra malesh, if you know what I mean. <laughs> okay, so for, for, uh, for, uh, for us newbies, translate. <laughs> Uh, that's IBM. Inshallah, Bukra, Badesh, which basically I, translates to. So it's God willing, right? Uh, yeah, God willing, maybe tomorrow. Okay. Um, Don't worry. Uh, yeah. <laughs> 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 uh, you, it, it, it's, it's fascinating. Capital moves very quickly there, mm. but also moves very slowly there. 
um, uh, technology. Uh, I was there at the beginning with the whole Dubai Internet City, Dubai Media City. Um, I'm not sure how much of that still remains. Um, I lived uh, just um, west of Dubai Media City. Mm. Uh, now where I lived has been torn down and, and uh, it's, it's part of Media City. <laughs> and in fact, the Sheikh's Palace has been torn down too. And the city has, has expanded. I was at the edge of the city at that point, And now the city has expanded way far beyond that. Um, I found it to be a place where you can go. And as long as you don't spend more than about six straight weeks there, uh, you can have a great time, get a lot done, but you need to, it, it, it has its own rarefied style of sort of fantasy Disneyland kind of a feel to it. If you're there for long enough, uh, think, think of almost like Vegas without the hookers and the gambling. Um, you will have, we'll take it to the right places. Don't worry. Yeah, no, I mean, I'm, there's lots of great places. Uh, I'm not saying that, uh, Al Maha is one of my favorite spots on the planet. Um, uh, but, I'm, I'm uh, curious about the direction this is going. <laughs> well, I, I, I would because a lot of the conversations around you know the downside of the of how they govern and yeah, there's there's problems, right? Atisalat is is a royal pain in the ass because they evolve so slowly, and they're so restrictive. Um, as you'll as you probably already know, Gordon, uh, you can't use uh, VoIP calling there unless you pay for a special plan to allow VoIP calling. Um, uh, wait, things wait, like sorry, that. Pause for uh, Arena is Arena is vigorously shaking her head. So there's ways around there's ways around everything. So just because it's of course there not is. providing you what you like, there's uh, there's other providers now. We are talking about you know back in 2002, you know before most of us were born. I'm sure that's yeah. fine, but but <laughs> but nowadays. Oh no no! I still maintain my connections. I still maintain my connections today. I've got a couple of friends there who've been there since I was there and are still there now, running capital funds, and the same problem. I can I can get them on WhatsApp most of the time, Skype a lot of the time, Google Meet is a pain in the ass, Zoom sort of works sometimes, sort of works other, doesn't work other times. And, and it's one of those things you just like, you know, it's, it's annoying, but it's one of those little things you pay, you're willing to pay the price because of the economy, the, the, the vibrancy of the, of the industry there. And that goes the same with anything else, right? Uh, Cayman Islands is uh, is the same situation. You know, everyone's like, oh, uh, he's got a bank account in the Cayman Islands. Well, if he has a bank account in the Cayman Islands, run screaming from that guy because he's an idiot. No one in their right mind would bank here. <laughs> but domicile here, sure, right? Awesome place to be domiciled. Um, and the same thing goes for Dubai, although Dubai's banking infrastructure is absolutely awesome, uh, which is a beautiful thing. Um, I just find it, uh, you know, that, that I don't see Dubai as the center of the world so much as I see it as an island of sanity in a world full of real craziness. Um, I'm really looking forward to seeing what they do in terms of a, a GCC, ideally, but even if it's just Dubai based, uh, CBDC. Oh, that's an interesting idea. Because you know, there's a, actually, that, sorry, that, that's fantastic. Pause, pause for a moment. So to our panelists, is there any central bank digital currency that you're seeing coming either on a on a UAE basis or GCC basis? Yes, imminent, is, uh, semi-imminent. I mean, where are they? Where are they in that process? See, um, semi-imminent. Uh, I think uh, Saeed can also add to that. There is a white paper that was created uh, jointly uh, between um, uh, uh, UAE and uh, Saudi Arabia to introduce a common uh, digital currency. It's still just an early research paper and I'm happy to <laughs> forward you a copy. Please. But I think uh, we're still making uh, the first baby steps. You have to understand Dubai cannot issue a CBDC. First, Dubai is not a country. Dubai is a province in uh, seven states uh, or seven, it's a state in seven states. So this digital, or any currency is controlled out of Abu Dhabi, which is the, the federal government, if you want. So sure. this has to be done at the federal government, not the provincial or the state level government. 
Well, that's not saying that Dubai doesn't necessarily put a proposal for us and say, we've got this great way to do this. And then Abu Dhabi goes, okay, we like that stamp. <laughs> yeah, it, happens all the, it happens all the time. Actually, there's a big competition uh, between uh, Dubai and Abu Dhabi, even in terms of architecture, in George, terms of but, ideas. But is Abra yeah. a settlement, a settlement network? Because I understood Abra was a settlement network, not a CBDC. <laughs> No, 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 no. It's another paper. Abra is, com it's not Abra, it's something completely different. So oh, the so... SAMA, uh, Central Saudi Arabia Monetary Agency, and the UAE Monetary Agency have gotten together and they've put together a paper on CBDC to create okay. interoperability. But uh, Saudi and UAE is not the GCC. GCC is uh, much more. So Bahrain, Kuwait, and now Qatar again and Oman have to be on board. But what, ha what has happened with uh, the settlement system that uh, Central Bank of uh, Saudi and Central Bank of the UAE have uh, introduced? I think it was like something like three years ago. Abra or Abra? Uh, I'm not sure. I forgot the name of it. I'm not f specific familiar with this one. But uh, 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 you're talking about Abar. Um, yes, you... yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Saeed, um, maybe yeah. you can comment. Yeah, so this is a settlement network and a settlement uh, kind of digital currency. But um, but yeah, this is more recent that um, George is talking about, and um, I'm pretty sure that you know uh, CBDCs is something that is being discussed within the various uh, GCC central banks. I think uh, I think it's still being researched and looked into and studied, and I think it will take at least a couple of years, if not a few years before it's um, seriously thought about and put into place, but it's an eventuality and I think it will happen at some point, being that, um, you know, gov governments in general in the GCC are pretty um, open-minded about tech. So uh, if it's financial tech um, and related to central banks, then I think ultimately it will be embraced at some stage. Yeah. Interesting. But we so, already we already have yeah. sorry, Gordon. We already have e Durham, right? Like a digital Durham. Yeah, e Durham didn't really kind of take off, and it's more of a kind of paying for uh, paying for different uh, public uh, government services using it, but it's not as you know as uh, mainstream or um, convenient as um, you know a CBDC could be, or a stable coin could be, or a cryptocurrency could be. So. Um, that's that's uh, how it is at the moment. Um, but yeah, I, I do have a hard stop, guys. I have to go get ready for soccer. Um, but that's always pleasure. a good reason. We're, we're actually within ten minutes of ending the show. But if but you need I to, do, I really have to run. But um, great they, meeting. We you really appreciate Thank you. you. Thank you for coming in. I know it was last minute. Our, our fabulous mystery guest. We look forward to speaking with you more. Just thank you. We, we Thank appreciate you for it. having me. Have a wonderful day. Have a wonderful evening, everyone. Thanks. I told him flat out it wouldn't be the Dubai All Stars without Saeed. But he did. <laughs> he, 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 he kind of virtually slapped me. All right. So we, we, we're, we're coming on the last 10 minutes, and I want to pass it to Richard Ross. Richard uh, wants to bring up a topic that's close to my heart. Uh, Richard, go ahead. Thank you. Um, so, first, in light of what Marco said, I'm reminded of something from Wire, just attention to aside that Wired wrote 20 years ago or 25 years ago, that Singapore is Disneyland as a police state, which is what Marco just said about UAE. Um, my question is that it seems to me from the uh, perspective of um, a provincial American, since we really don't know uh, world affairs, that there's been a recent flowering of Dubai and the UAE over the last six months or so. Um, and I was wondering what's the relationship and the impact of the Abraham Accords on what's going on in du uh, Dubai and um, Abu Dhabi, or is it just my sense of things because um, I get information from the family office community and in the family office space, people are interested in Dubai, you know, it seems to me because of what we're hearing through the Abraham Accords. It's sort of the similar communities. So I don't know if that's really what's going on there or, and just my pers or just my perspective. So what's the impact of the Abraham Accords on what's going on there? Great question. Let me, let me throw it to the panel and just jump in. Yeah, I, I guess I can take that because I've been on a couple of uh, panels uh, um, which has had uh, a number of uh, Israeli investors from different sectors. And uh, because we are situated in the Dubai International Financial Center, we operate from there. 
So we've seen a lot of uh, delegations come around. Uh, we know from the uh, real estate uh, uh, perspective that there's a lot of interest on uh, purchase of real estate. Uh, we know that there, 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 there are delegations that are here to uh, invest, here to raise capital. You can see them in the, uh, in the malls. You can see them uh, renting spaces. And uh, we've got a couple of restaurants that are, uh, that are catering to uh, kosher food where mm -hmm. the, uh, uh, where the uh, stove is being uh, uh, light, uh, lit by the mm -hmm. uh, rabbi uh, remotely. So, you know, there's a lot of stuff that's happening. I, I'm sorry, did I get Remotely? that right? <laughs> there's a, there's, he's sitting there in Jerusalem, like, you know, eating his, yeah, exactly. eating his salad. So, like, okay. it, it, there's a robot with pay us. There, there's a robot with pay us there right. doing it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's, so, that's so you know, it's, it's pretty much true. That whatever you're hearing, there is a lot of activity as far as the Abraham Accord is concerned. Uh, and uh, initially, everywhere I went, uh, uh, you know, this whole process was, uh, I heard just one thing, whether it was seminars, Zoom calls, or even in Jitex, or even uh, other places, especially when uh, the biotech community came through, there were cybersecurity uh, specialists that were coming through. Uh, we've been approached by at least uh, half a dozen uh, Israeli uh, entities who want to do tie-ups. And, uh, and they're not looking for capital per se, but they are looking for introductions and uh, businesses that they can contribute towards. They've set separate budgets. So there's a lot of activity as far as uh, uh, the uh, Israelis and the UAE community, business community is concerned. Uh, initially, we thought that uh, 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 there was going to be a lot of uh, pitching for uh, funding. Uh, and then slowly and steadily, uh, we found out that, yes, they are here to invest also. Uh, you know, there was a little bit of skepticism uh, on an individual level, whether they would invest in real estate, whether they would come into the gold and uh, diamond community, whether they would actually set roots over here. We haven't seen that happen, but we've seen a lot of activity, right? Which is, which is giving us belief that that could be the next uh, flow of uh, tourism. That's where it's come from, right? Uh, I think there might be a slight delay because of uh, COVID and stuff like that in terms of uh, accessibility and travel and logistics. Uh, but uh, Carrefour and major supermarkets have started importing uh, fruits and vegetables out of uh, Israel, mm. uh, which, is, uh, which is pretty good. So now you can see them on the shelves. So from, from, from that level to uh, institutional level, there, there is sufficient amount of activity, if, if I can uh, answer that for you. Do you, do you, um, let, 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 let me ask a question. Do you see, you, you mentioned gold, and I think I heard you see diamonds. Do you see a sort of triangle maybe forming between Dubai, Israel, and Amsterdam when it yeah. comes to the diamond trade? And uh, York. Amsterdam, Belgium. Belgium, right. okay. Right, right, right. Yeah, so that's already there. Uh, you see, the only difference was that uh, uh, all the Israeli diamonds were coming through Belgium. That was mm. the only difference. Ah. Uh, because it's the same diamonds, right? And, uh, and, uh, and uh, you know, uh, I guess De Beers is on both sides of that, uh, of that, uh, of that uh, <laughs> pond, right? For, for, the pa for the past century. Absolutely, yeah. it's going to be there for the next Not uh, a monopoly, century. though. Yeah, yeah no, no, of course not. We, how can they be monopolistic, <laughs> right? And, uh, and, and, and we know where those diamonds come from, right? And we know uh, because the same diamonds in terms of rough are exported through Surat, which is in India, which is again a big uh, uh, center for, uh, for rough diamonds and polishing. So we know where these diamonds come from. They have an African connection, not an African connection. But as soon as they get into jewelry, uh, we have a business that, uh, 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 we have a self-grown business, which is into mazonites, which is made by carbon, uh, uh, what is it, silicone carbonite, carbide, mm. uh, rather than nitrogen, right? So uh, we do that business of uh, uh, solitaires and jewelry. And uh, we see uh, exceptional amount of demand in uh, Dubai as far as larger solitaire stones are concerned mm. at, uh, at a price discount, because there is so much of confusion with the next, with the new generation on uh, what size they should wear and what is the authenticity or the source of those diamonds. So, yeah. So, so did, you know. the next time I get married, this is a good tip. <laughs> get the fake diamond. <laughs> you know, like, like I said, for the next time I get married. Now, now, now that I'm learning Okay, lesson, okay. <laughs> we're, we're all, we're all, all crying into our coffee cups for you. I know, I know. Well, whatever. Okay, uh, Arena and uh, George, I, I, just just okay. to kind of, your thoughts, we're going to have to wrap up super soon, but I, I want to get your final thoughts on Abraham Accords and whether you're, you're seeing any material impact, whether it's in the future or just your sense uh, of it. 
peace is good uh, either way. However you slice it, peace and peaceful business relationship and business deals is good for everyone. It's good for, good for every side, good for people, good for governments, just good for everyone. I'm all for peace and love and understanding. And we have us as individuals, we have nothing to fight about. You know, the governments keep uh, squirreling. But um, interestingly, uh, Israel and Israeli companies and Israeli technologies uh, have been in the UAE from get-go or hmm. cyber security for oil and gas and for the maritime hmm. sector who was the, which companies did provide that israelis uh, yes they set up an office in london and they've done it out of there but hmm. uh, the technology um, you know the little scooters you see uh, driving all over dubai the um, the the uh, the person who invented that was an um, you know that certain sort of like a, a battery thing was an israeli inventor and the patent is issued there so yes of course they had to set up an office elsewhere and to bring it uh, you know through other routes the vegetables that we used to buy uh, or that we are buying and um, that are labeled from jordan or labeled from uh, holland they're mm. actually israeli grown vegetables that got shipped to jordan and then reshipped to dubai so a lot of business was going on uh, lots of uh, you know undercover had to be done now we don't have to do that uh, people don't have to you know hide or pretend uh, which is which is a good thing, um, you know. There's a big uh, Jewish community in Dubai. Lots of people had to pretend to uh, have uh, broken noses instead of their, uh, their normal noses, um, uh, you know. Um, so uh, now they can openly be Jewish, you know. Just look at that. Uh, yeah, I had my nose broken three times, right? So um, now you don't have to do that, and you can be openly yourself. Which is either way you slice it. It's a great thing. It's a great, fantastic piece. Is a good thing. Will uh, Israelis come and buy properties in Dubai? I really, I really, I really believe so. Have you seen the property prices in Israel? It's ridiculous. <laughs> uh, weather is better. Uh, people are much more fun. Food is pretty much the same. I, I mean, why wouldn't you live in Dubai, right? It's I've been to Israel. I've been to Dubai, and D Dubai, they're they're nicer. To be honest, yeah, we are. No, much of course, for sure. <laughs> of course. <laughs> so, sorry, just just just, sort of, know, just just because we're crunching down on like the last couple of minutes. Sorry, yeah. I, I, yeah. I want to let the mayor of yeah. Dubai, Please. you know, give okay, us the final. Okay, there's a few insights. things that I wanted to add. I mean, of course, uh, many Israelis have been coming to Dubai for the last few years. Uh, many of them have got dual citizenship or others, so this is nothing. Just now they can officially come with maybe uh, their national passport rather than a second uh, citizenship passport. One thing you should actually be aware, since mm. there's a few people also here from Bahrain, mm. uh, there is actually Bahraini um, uh, Jewish people, like locally. And there's actually yes. a Jewish cemetery in Bahrain. So uh, there's about 20, 30 Bahrainis that are national Bahrainis, but they're of Jewish origin and they practice the, the Jewish religion. So it is good to have peace. And I do believe that um, there's a lot of cooperation in the works in the area, for example, of blockchain, if you got signed, if you happen to be during JITEX, you saw a lot of activity where there was a boot for these various countries, mm -hmm. so which integrated a lot. So the, I will see a lot of cooperation in the future, especially in specific sectors. I do believe in IT and definitely cybersecurity mm -hmm. uh, since uh, Israel is a, quite a leader in this area and I've been involved in cybersecurity for over 20 plus years. So uh, being able to have a more open border policy, uh, it's actually going to be good for uh, both countries or both regions as well and to have a more harmonized uh, overall uh, region as well. Beautiful. Um I think we're I think we're gonna end on, on that note because we, we took up our two hours. It it went very quickly. I'm I, I just I just wanna say I'm fantastically grateful to our panel, uh, to our guests, to everyone, you know, to my co hosts, to everyone who participated. I'm on a personal note, I'm grateful that you know there was a pause in the series and when we picked up it was so powerful the way we picked up and it, it's just it's just a beautiful thing. Uh, Sandra, like I like to say, do you want to land the plane and then we'll, we'll release everyone for their coffee or dinners or beverages? Sure. I, I think you're absolutely right, Gordon. I think there's, this is the kickoff of a very positive year because it all starts with us, with our mindset. And I think the energy was really good. 
the time flew by. We had a lot of attendance, not only in the, the Zoom, but also on the YouTube channel where we were live streaming. So, um, yeah, yeah, on behalf of the both of us, really great. Thanks for joining everybody. Uh, please follow us on the YouTube, on the Telegram, on the LinkedIn, on all the channels and spread the word because our goal is to spread information and knowledge and opportunities with a community where we all would like to contribute contribute and help each other. But for today, yeah. thank you to all the guest speakers, the panelists, the alumni speakers, a lot of familiar faces coming back. And next week, Gordon, you're in Dubai. So we're going to continue our our, our Crypto Wednesdays. Uh, so please- And we're probably, we're, we're going to be doing many shows from Dubai. Yeah, yeah and again, I, just, just to call out, I, you know, I want to say, Pedro, thanks for nudging Saeed. You know, that was a very last minute combination. I think we swarmed him. So you're my guy. Sergey, Arena, you know, Xavier, you popped on, Marco. I mean, I, I see all these familiar faces. Uh, Alexis Yellow was on. It's just awesome. I like Alexis. to see your face too, brother. I'm glad you're feeling better, oh, bro. I told yeah, you. Yeah. 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 Palsy goes and comes, bro. Pedro, Pedro knew about all my personal drama and all the hell stuff, but you know, like everything's yeah. good now. So I'm, I'm appreciative. Yeah, 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 all right, yeah, Gordon, yeah. let's not forget you've got to do a Caribbean tour soon. Hell yeah, I'm yeah. staying at your place. Hey, okay, yeah. every, everyone, <laughs> peace, love, see you in the Middle East. Talk to you soon. Thank you so much. Thank you you make much. it a great day, Will. Ciao, guys. Yes, yes. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 Bye.